All right, well, welcome here. Uh, and thanks to uh, Dean Ball and Associate Dean um, Russell and the BSOS faculty for putting together this exciting discussion today. This event is important because it brings together brilliant legal minds to discuss some of the most urgent topics surrounding U.S. migration policy, including the U.S. borders, deportations, the travel ban, or should I say the travel bans, immigration reform, and the role of U.S. circuit courts. Uh, it, this event also provides an opportunity for you to engage with our Year of Immigration Initiative. Let me just tell you what our Year of Immigration Initiative is. Uh, we uh, have two goals, essentially. One is to educate the community throughout the year uh, on issues related to uh, uh, immigration, global migration, and refugees. And when I say the community, I mean inside and outside of the gates of the university. You may, uh, you may not know that one in four residents of Prince George's County is an immigrant. The second goal, really, is to take advantage of that educational opportunity to foster a more inclusive community and to celebrate one of the strengths and core values of uh, our community, the university, which is diversity. Uh, we, would, we are organizing activities throughout the year into basically three buckets, conversation, community, and culture. Uh, there will be courses offered, key panel, key panel discussions, lectures, study abroad programs, uh, and, and, and more. You may know that The Refugees has been selected uh, as the first year book, and there are 6,500 copies of that book now being distributed. Uh, and the author of that book, a Pulitzer Prize winner, Viet Thanh Nguyen, will be on campus next month um, for two days as a guest writer. And we hope that uh, you, may you, you may attend that, uh, uh, that keynote lecture. Uh, we're having community uh, engagements uh, activities. We'll have a translate-a-thon providing free services for, uh, for uh, anyone who wants something translated for free. We're having a workshop using design, uh, uh, design, uh, design theory workshop to uh, train people to, uh, to conduct the uh, uh, Census 2020, which is, of course, a very sensitive issue right now in, in immigrant communities. We'll have cultural events, including the Human Library, storytelling, film series, food festivals, and much, much more. So we, uh, we would like you to uh, use your Twitter accounts today uh, and use the hashtag Year of Immigration uh, and visit our website, yearofimmigration.umd.edu, uh, year uh, to learn more about upcoming events. So without further ado, let me turn it back to our panel moderator, Dr. Robert Kulish, the director of the M-Law programs and the Joel J. Feller Research Professor in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences and a lecturer with the UMB Carey School of Law. We have our three panelists. Timing is perfect and we're ready to go. Um, we are going to start with uh, Professor Maureen Sweeney. Uh, Professor Sweeney has directed the Immigration Clinic at the University of Maryland Carey School of Law since 2004. <clears throat> Professor Sweeney is the author of several law review articles. Um, I teach a, a class at the law school and every, semester, every, every year when I'm teaching my class, um, I beg Professor Sweeney to come in and to spend a little time with my students and we use several of her articles the one that I like very much is the Padilla article that, that we use. And um, uh, in addition to that, Professor Sweeney is founding member of the Maryland Immigrant Rights uh, Coalition, a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting Maryland immigrants through the coordination and enhancement of pro bono representation of low income immigrants, community education and advocacy on behalf of immigrants. In 2015, she was awarded the Benjamin L. Cardin Distinguished Service Award by the Maryland Legal Services Corporation. This is an award presented yearly to an outstanding public interest lawyer whose career has been dedicated to providing, promoting, or managing civil legal services to low-income Marylanders. 
Without further ado, Maureen Sweeney. I'm going to stand up so I can see you all better. Uh, can everybody hear me in the back? Good. OK. So um, I have been working with immigrants uh, and specifically with asylum seekers, people who come to the US fleeing some kind of persecution from their, in their own home country, uh, for 30 years now. And one of the things that that work has done for me has given me a great appreciation for the American Constitution. Um, I spend a lot of time fighting against the US government, so it might surprise you to have me come in and, and extol the virtues of the Constitution, except that the Constitution is what allows me to do what I do. Uh, and I have seen over the years how countries that don't have as robust a constitutional system uh, lead to situations where people end up fleeing and they come here uh, and end up having to tell their story to some immigration lawyer to try and, and win asylum. Uh, so what I want to talk to you about today is one feature of our Constitution that I think is really key in this moment, uh, and that is key to the success of the American experiment. Not that that experiment has been perfect, um, and I would be the first to be critical of many of the things that we're seeing today, but I do think that, it has, that our, our system has a resilience about it that is in large part due to our system of the separation of powers and the balance of powers between the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judiciary. Um, you're thinking to yourself, oh my god, I came out at 9 o'clock on a rainy morning to hear about the separation of powers. This sounds really boring. Um, but it's not, I promise you. Uh, because the, the separation of powers is what allows us to give, to have the checks and balances in our, in our government. So that we, when we have one branch or two branches that start to run amok in one way or another, uh, there is a third branch that can always pull it in, uh, and that is what's really key. As a lawyer, I operate often uh, in the judicial branch. I'm in the courts, right? Royce is a lawyer who operates in the legislature, right, and, and, and in the courts. And, and these, these different types of advocacy inform each other, uh, and, and we work best when we're working together. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about some of the reasons that the checks and balances don't work as well in the immigration field as they might. Um, how many of you have ever heard of the Chinese Exclusion Act or the Chinese Exclusion Case? Okay, so this is the first big uh, Supreme Court case in our country. Uh, it was, uh, the decision came out in 1889 and it involved something called the Chinese Exclusion Act, which, um, if you're thinking to yourself, that sounds kind of problematic, that we would just exclude all the Chinese. Yeah, it was. It was totally problematic. Uh, it was an act that was passed by Congress based on the worst kinds of racial stereotypes and cate categorizing uh, of people. Uh, the assumption was that the Chinese were incapable of assimilating to U.S. Uh, culture. And so the Congress passed this law, passed a whole series of laws that, that uh, basically deprived Chinese people of equal protection uh, under the law and of the right to come to the United States or return to the United States or even to stay in the United States. Um, and so we had this, uh, this Supreme Court case, uh, and that's a whole story unto itself. There's actually a great documentary out by, I don't know who, but if you just Google it, Chinese Exclusion Documentary, it, uh, it's, it's really, it tells that history. Um, but that case, when the Supreme Court issued its decision, it, it, it grounded its authority, or it grounded the government's authority to pass that law in the inherent sovereignty of the nation and connected it to foreign relations and to national security. Uh, and from that flowed a whole series of cases uh, that established this kind of extreme deference to Congress and to the president when it comes to immigration matters. So we're used to having, we're used to hearing about the courts uh, enforcing the constitutionality of our laws, right? So we, we uh, have this idea that you can, if, somebody, if, a, if a legislature passes a law that infringes, for example, on the 
uh, rights of a particular nationality for no good reason, uh, you ought to be able to go into court and say that's unconstitutional. That's a violation of equal protection. Well, what the Chinese exclusion case did was uh, establish a precedent that said, yes, but in the immigration area, we're going to give special leeway. We're going to give a lot of leeway to Congress and to the president because, you know, these are such difficult issues. Uh, and so we have this long history uh, of case law that allows Congress and the president to do all kinds of things that they would never get away with in other areas of the law because it's immigration. Uh, and that's the legacy that we still have from the Chinese exclusion case, um, which was the, the case of a, a man named uh, Che Chan Ping, um, who has, you know, he, he, he's, his, his, his reputation has been rehabilitated, but the immigration systems continues to be dragged through the mud because of this case. The other thing that the Chinese exclusion case uh, did was establish the principle that deportation is not punishment in the same way that criminal incarceration is punishment, right? And why does that matter? That matters because our Constitution has a whole series of protections built into it for criminal defendants, right? Uh, you have the right to uh, due process. You have the right to a lawyer. You have the right to a jury by a, uh, a jury of your peers. You have a right to punishment that is only proportional to whatever crime you committed. And when the Supreme Court held that deportation is not punishment, it basically exempted the deportation system from all those protections. So even today, you have no right, guaranteed right to a lawyer in immigration proceedings. More than half of the people who go through <coughs> deportation proceedings do it on their own without a lawyer in a language they probably don't speak as their native tongue. Um, imagine trying to defend yourself in those circumstances in a very complicated area of the law. Um, so these are, um, the, this is the, the kind of the, the, the legal foundation for this system that we have now. Uh, and, and we have an issue, immigration, that has over the years kind of waxed and waned in its um, importance politically. But when it does become, when it does rise to the front uh, in, in politics, it's often a very volatile issue a very emotional issue, just like it is right now. This is not the first time we've seen this as a country. Uh, this is often the way immigration um, rises up uh, as an issue. And so you have a lot of people who want to use immigration as a political issue who really are not that interested, frankly, in solving the problems in the system. They don't necessarily care whether the system works or not. Um, or they care to the extent that it serves their purposes politically, so that you, you have politics actually being a, um, a negative force. Despite the fact that if you remember from the, the Chinese exclusion case, the idea was that Congress and the President were more able to deal with immigration precisely because they were elected, right? They were politically elected and therefore accountable to people for foreign affairs types of decisions and national security decisions. So you have this political accountability that in the, in the case law is seen as a formal matter as a, as a good thing, um, when in reality the, the political nature of the immigration issue often plays against any uh, problem solving that happens and against uh, a lot of um, principles that we hold dear of fairness and protection of minorities uh, and things like that. Okay, so I want to tell two stories here today about uh, the judiciary uh, and its uh, participation in the immigration issue uh, in recent decades. Uh, and in order to do that, I just have to set the stage a little bit about what role the judiciary plays in the immigration court system. Uh, the immigration courts, we call them courts, but they're not part of the judiciary. They're not part of the judicial branch. They're actually part of the Department of Justice, which is part of the executive branch, right? And who's the head of the Department of Justice at the moment? Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General, right? He is the boss of the, of the Department of Justice. And our immigration courts sit under him institutionally. So he actually has enormous power to direct 
the interpretation of the law uh, within the immigration courts, and he has the power to hire and fire immigration judges and Board of Appeals members. Uh, and that has, always, that has been the case for a long time uh, under our structure. Um, but Attorney General Sessions is really taking advantage of this power in a way that outstrips his predecessors. Uh, Attorney General Sessions has a long history with the immigration issue uh, coming from Alabama. Um, but for him, it's always been a really uh, kind of a, a signature political issue even though Alabama's wouldn't be the first place you would think about in terms of the immigration issue, right? So he might be one of those examples of people that use immigration as a political tool rather than actually for problem solving. Um, so concretely, what does that mean? Uh, it means that uh, Attorney General Sessions is going around the country, he keeps giving these speeches to immigration judges in which he literally is reading them the regulation that says, you work for me and it's your job to implement my policy, which is the president's policy. So he is reminding judges very clearly that they're not independent <coughs> judges. They are actually, as the regulations say, attorneys serving at the pleasure of the attorney general. And he is actually like literally kind of shaking his finger at them, saying, you have to do what I say. Um, there is another regulation, just to be clear, that says that immigration judges need to exercise their independent judgment. Um, he's, he doesn't remind them about that one. Um, but many of them, and I, and I don't mean by, by sort of explaining this context, I don't mean to be impugning by any means uh, the good faith of many of our immigration judges out there, our Board of Appeals members. Um, I thank God every day that they're there um, because they are really, they are what um, is, is really standing between this onslaught uh, this anti-immigrant onslaught that's coming from the administration uh, and the individuals whose lives are on the line in their courts every day. Um, but there's an enormous amount of pressure on these judges and on these appeals board members uh, to do what the Attorney General says. The Attorney General also has another even more direct power, which is that if he doesn't like a decision that comes out of an immigration judge's courtroom or out of the Board of Immigration Appeals, he can just certify the decision to himself and change it. Uh, and that then becomes the official interpretation of that provision, whatever the provision is. Uh, and the judges and the board members are then bound to follow that. So, there's, so it's really, I mean, when I say that the Attorney General has enormous power over immigration, I, I'm not exaggerating. Um, and, and so you're saying to yourself, okay, so where do the courts come in after this? Um, this, the hierarchy in terms of decision making is someone goes in front of an immigration judge uh, who is a Department of Justice employee, they can appeal to the Board of Immigration Appeals, uh, which is also staffed by Department of Justice employees, and then if they, if they lose at the BIA or the Board of Immigration Appeals, they can then petition for review in the federal courts, in the Federal Court of Appeals. And that's where we, that's our first appearance before the judiciary, right? So that's the first time that we've, we've uh, moved out of the executive branch here, okay? And so that's what I want to talk about is the role of the courts of appeals uh, and how that, uh, how they can help shape uh, the interpretation even within the Justice Department. Um, so, uh, and, and just one other detail on the, on the Justice Department so that we understand that this is not just a theoretical kind of power that the Justice Department has over immigration. Um, it, the Justice Department through the U.S. attorneys uh, is the agency uh, responsible for criminally prosecuting immigration violations as well. Now I just had said that deportation is not a criminal offense, right? Well, but there are provisions in our law that do criminalize unlawful entry and unlawful re-entry so that, that it, you can be criminally charged. And of course, this is what Attorney General Sessions has done with the zero tolerance policy is to say, we're going to criminally prosecute everybody, even if they come here, if they're coming here seeking asylum, if they enter illegally, we're going to criminally prosecute them and then they can, they can go about their asylum application, but first we're going to criminally prosecute them. Uh, and just to, to put that into perspective, the prosecutions, and this is not just under Sessions, but for, for um, 
a decade, really, starting under the Obama administration, the majority of federal criminal prosecutions in the country are for illegal entry and illegal reentry. So every other kind of criminal prosecution that the federal government does, drugs, weapons trafficking, white collar crime, all that kind of stuff, all added together don't add up to the prosecutions for immigration. So for, for a decade now, we have had this system in the, in the Department of Justice that is weighted very heavily toward punishment of uh, irregular migrants. Right? So if you have people who come here seeking asylum uh, or looking for a better life, but they don't go through the immigration process, they're fed through this Department of Justice prosecution machine. Uh, and so that's the context in which uh, these, this immigration court system, uh, though it's not a court system, um, works. <coughs> okay, so what are the two stories that I want to tell? The first is, um, has to do with Maryland's theft offense. Um, and this is in a, in a context in which uh, Congress, in starting in the 80s and then really accelerating in 1996 and 97, there were some, there were, there were, the, the law was largely rewritten, and the, the consequences for having a criminal conviction became much more severe. And you could lose your green card for, you still can lose your green card, uh, your permanent residence, for a huge range of different offenses, including theft and petty theft. Right, so you steal a pack of gum at a convenience store. In certain circumstances, you could lose your permanent residence because of that, okay, if you're convicted of stealing the pack of gum. Um, so, and, and, in, and in 1996, Congress um, really expanded that, which Congress has the right to do under our system, right? So that's one, they're one of the political branches. They write the law. Uh, and they have the right to write the law in whatever way they want within the limits of the Constitution. Uh, those, those provisions were reviewed and the courts said, yeah, that's okay. Um, and then the executive started, the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security started enforcing these provisions even more broadly than they were written. So you have this, this kind of uh, enforcement where Anybody who has any contact with the criminal justice system is running the risk that they're going to lose their status. Uh, and, uh, and so then um, advocates were in the position of how do we respond to this, right? This seems disproportionate. Remember what I said that, that the Eighth Amendment, which, uh, which says that, that our punishment, our criminal punishment has to be proportionate to the crime, doesn't apply to immigration. Right, so you're thinking to yourself, stealing a pack of gum does not seem like something that really justifies deportation, uh, exile essentially from your home and your family. Um, and you're right, uh, but there's, that limit doesn't apply, that constitutional limit doesn't apply because of the way our courts have uh, interpreted the immigration uh, system. So advocates have a couple different choices. One is to change the law to go to Congress and get Congress to change the law. And advocates have tried to do that for, well, since 1996, and we're still trying, right? Um, the other possibility is to go to the courts and at least try and limit what's happening in the, in the deportation proceedings to how the, how the law is written. Uh, and so that was at least a way to challenge the over enthusiastic enforcement of these provisions uh, that DHS and before DHS, the INS were doing. Okay. Um, so, so that's what advocates started to do. Uh, and the thing to know about that is that there was a lot of losing, right? Before you ever win, often in the immigration world, you lose a lot. Right? So we would go and make these arguments in immigration court and get slapped down. And then we'd go to the Board of Immigration Appeals and get slapped down. And, we, and in the meantime, our clients are detained because of other provisions in the law. Uh, but the important thing is that when we would finally get to the federal courts, we finally had an audience that was willing to listen to the limits of the law. Uh, there was a... Um, 
and enthusiasm for enforcement uh, in the immigration court and in the Board of Appeals that was not the same in the, the courts of appeals. The courts of appeals were willing to actually enforce the limits of the law as the Supreme Court dictated that it did. So we started, it was literally 10 years ago, we started bringing these cases and argue, bringing these arguments in different immigration cases uh, that, that the theft defense in Maryland was broader than what the federal, uh, how, the, how the federal deportation statute defines theft and therefore should not be used to be able to uh, deport people. Uh, and we lost and lost and lost, and we would win small cases, but they were unpublished, and so nobody else had to hire the, or had to follow them. Uh, and then finally, we um, uh, really came together in a coalition, and this is one of, my, one of my takeaways from this experience, is that it is so important to work together and to be organized, and to be organized with the community so that we as lawyers are not just doing our technical legal thing, but that we're doing it in a community that can really bring about change. Uh, and so we had a group that met regularly that involved public defenders, uh, that involved criminal defense attorneys, that involved uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, and private, uh, private immigration lawyers. And we were able to kind of coordinate and find good cases to bring this case law so that we little by little um, were able to establish the legal principles that built up to a conclusion, we just got a decision from the Fourth Circuit, which is our Federal Court of Appeals, uh, on June 15th that said that Maryland's theft defense is overbroad and that it cannot be used to deport anybody. So after 10 years, we finally have that limitation. Um, the sad part of the story is that, of course, there are thousands of people who've been deported over the course of that 10 years and before then on the basis of this statute. But the good news is that going forward, and I just I keep hearing more and more uh, about this uh, case that it's limiting uh, people's, uh, it, it's limiting the government's ability to deport people. All right, and I have two minutes left, but I want to, so that's a story that has a happy ending. Uh, there is another story that's playing out right now. Um, the Attorney General, just four days before our decision uh, in the Leva Martinez case, the Fourth Circuit decision that I just mentioned, uh, issued a decision called Matter of AB which is about the rights of asylum seekers. Um, and in that decision, he is purporting, I don't think he has the legal right to do this, but he is, he is trying to influence the way that immigration judges are, are interpreting our asylum law so that it will not cover people who are survivors of domestic violence uh, and people who are the victims of gang violence in Central America. Why is he doing this? He's doing this very clearly for political purposes. They're trying to shut down the border so they can claim a political victory on that. But the truth of the matter is the people coming to our border are asylum seekers. And they have every right under US law to seek asylum, not just US law, but international law, because that's where our asylum law comes from. They have the right, uh, absolutely, to, to make those claims. Uh, and so this is just a, just a, a, a pure political move by the Attorney General uh, and it's again going to be to advocates to fight those cases, to take them to the immigration court level. There we may find judges who, who are sympathetic to, I think, what is the proper interpretation of the law that would recognize asylum in many of these cases, uh, but we may not. And if not, then we appeal it to the Board of Appeals, and if we don't get satisfaction there, then we go back to the Courts of Appeals. And so that's what we're going to be looking at for the next five, ten years, uh, unless we have an administration that comes in and changes this interpretation, is that we're going to be looking again to the federal courts to direct uh, the, the immigration system to do the right thing. The other thing, just to be clear, once the federal court makes this decision, that is the law, and the immigration system has to follow it. So just a couple last thoughts. Um, judges matter, right? Who the judges are matters. We have a big nomination. Uh, <coughs> review on. going on right now. Um, it matters who the judges are, and it matters who the president is and who the senators are, because they're the ones who both nominate the, the judges, but then also approve them. So elections matter. Uh, judges matter and elections matter. And um, it all, in an ideal world, keeps the system working. I think we're going to swing back, um, but we need to uh, 
you know, there's, there's a swing that needs to happen and it's not going to happen by itself. It happens because we all participate in the system and do our part to make it function the way it should. Thank you. Well, that was a great way to start. Um, we see the tension between the rule of law and politics, uh, which plays a role in so much of immigration. Um, next, I would like to introduce uh, Royce Bernstein Murray, who is the policy director at the uh, American Immigration Council, which is a foremost advocacy policy and litigation NGO in Washington, D.C. It's there that uh, uh, Royce Murray oversees the council's administrative and legislative advocacy. She holds a JD from Georgetown University Law Center. She's a member of the New York Bar. Uh, she's responsible largely with her organization from taking law to the policy field and working to change policy through evidence-based reports and investigations. On that front, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, I apologize that there are folks still standing. If anyone has an empty seat, will you raise your hand? Just the one. I could see that from the front. I was hoping there were a bunch of empty seats in case anybody would like to sit. Um, I'm delighted that there is a standing room only crowd here um, for the year of immigration. Uh, these are interesting times. And I think that interesting times have drawn an incredible amount of attention um, and energy to the issues surrounding immigration. And I'm delighted that uh, you're directing your studies and your attention uh, towards this field. So why do we talk about immigrants on Constitution Day? To some extent, that seems like there would be a disconnect. So I actually, we didn't study Constitution Day when I was growing up. It's a newer holiday um, in public conscience. <laughs> and so I actually did a little searching around myself and learned, and I thought I would share this fun fact, because there aren't a lot of fun facts in immigration these days, um, that in 1941, the congressional record recognized a Hungarian immigrant woman as the founder of Citizenship Day, which was then merged with Constitution Day in 2004. But that Citizenship Day was, was named for this Hungarian immigrant woman who was a refugee hmm. uh, from Hungary uh, because she founded the Americanization League of America to help people with citizenship education. And so there are immigrants not only at the roots of our country, I mean we talk about that always, that we're a nation of immigrants, but that even this very holiday where we celebrate the values of the Constitution, that we celebrate the values of citizenship, um, is rooted in refugees and immigrants. And I found that particularly poignant, given that yesterday there was an announcement that the um, administration would be slashing its refugee admission numbers for the coming fiscal year, which begins October 1st. And the process for admitting refugees from overseas um, involves the president basically setting a number, which is a goal to reach for the State Department and the Department of Homeland Security to interview and admit refugees from around the world. And despite the fact that we have record numbers of displaced people around the world, we are going to have record low numbers of refugee admissions in the coming year. Now, it was already low from this past fiscal year. The administration had authorized 45,000 refugees to be admitted, and the fiscal year is about to end in the next couple of weeks at the end of September, and we're on track to admit 22,000, which is dismal. But we're doubling down on that next year, rather than trying to improve our efforts. I mean, when the historical average is 95,000, when we since for the years, the decades that we've had a refugee admissions program, we had been admitting on average 95,000 refugees a year. They announced yesterday that the goal for next year will be 30,000. And if it keeps, if the actual admissions numbers keep pace with what this past year is going to be, we'll see many fewer actually admitted. So it's not a good time for refugees in this country, and our moral leadership in this world is in question when we abdicate our responsibility as one of a number of countries that welcome the stranger and welcome the persecuted. And that's something that we are really seeing in these days, is this really unprecedented attack on asylum seekers, on refugees, on immigrants. And this, all of this, despite the fact that our Constitution focuses very heavily, and a lot of our work focuses very, very heavily, 
on the due process and equal protection provided by the Constitution. And that's not limited to citizens. Section 1 of the 14th Amendment reads, in part, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And so Professor Sweeney spoke about some of the limitations through the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court on how we have applied um, our laws to immigrants, but at its core, the Constitution provides due process and equal protection to all people, regardless of their citizenship. The Constitution could have specified that these rights only applied to citizens, and it did not. So where are we today? I mentioned the refugee numbers, and I will note that within those refugee numbers, there are breakdowns by geographic region. So there's one overarching number, but then for different regions of the world, there are different target goals. And I will note that of the 22,000 or so we expect by the end of the year, the only region that is going to be over its target are Europeans. It's all the other geographic regions that are going to be maybe 50% below their targets. So this is not a subtle or an accidental policy that's taking place. Refugees, which are those coming from overseas, um, are being treated much like asylum seekers right now. We are seeing asylum seekers, just like immigrants, maligned day in and day out. They're being associated as criminals, even though study after study has shown that immigrants commit crimes at lower rates than the native born. They're being described as taking advantage of loopholes, otherwise known as our laws. Our laws provide rights. In fact, there's a right to apply for asylum. And it's unequivocal. And although we are, it was mentioned, the zero tolerance policy of prosecuting those who arrive at our borders, they are get, getting in the way of people of applying for asylum despite the fact that there is an unequivocal right to apply for asylum. The, uh, the attack on asylum seekers has been from the moment they try to reach our borders. We have pending litigation um, with other partners on the practice of US government officials turning away um, asylum seekers at the border. Basically stopping them one way or another, telling them that the US is no longer open for asylum, no longer welcome Central Americans, um, that the uh, border patrol station is full, that they have to come back another day, that they have to wait in line. And meanwhile, they're waiting on the Mexican side. Sometimes they are Mexicans being waiting on the Mexican side. Coming here for a range of reasons, but among them are those that are fleeing violence and persecution and turning them, way, them away is illegal. And so when a lot of those individuals who were turned away at a port of entry, which it is legal to go there and present yourself as an applicant for asylum, then tried to cross between a port of entry, though they presented themselves to border patrol agents, they were then taken into custody and prosecuted. So they tried to do it the legal way. They couldn't. They were apprehended trying to uh, enter between the ports of entry. Then they get taken into custody for prosecution. These are misdemeanor prosecutions, as were mentioned. Um, if, they, if this is not their first time, it's a felony for, re, for attempting to re-enter. But what we've seen is not only these criminal prosecutions happening, but also that families were separated. And I know everyone should be familiar if you have had your eyes open in the last four or five months. Since April, and the zero tolerance policy was announced since May when it really was put into full effect, we've seen over 2,500 children separated from their parents at the border. As part of this deterrence strategy to prosecute asylum seekers, nearly all of them were asylum seekers. Um, and just to note, the Department of Homeland Security has no expertise in, taking, in separating children from their parents. They have no authority to separate children from their parents. When you go through customs, when you return from a country, if you had an old DUI arrest, they don't get to take your kids away. But they're doing that at the border right now. And hundreds of parents were deported with their kids left behind. And still to this day, and I'll let Serene talk more about the very successful litigation challenging these efforts. Um, still to this day, we have several hundred children still in government custody without their parents. 
It will be a stain. We'll look back on these times as really, I think, a shameful moment um, in American history. Finally, I'll just close by noting, we've talked a lot about family separation in recent months. And our concern is that family detention is being proposed as the solution to family separation. And that's a set of false choices. So we have three family detention centers right now. We have several thousand parents uh, detained with their children for many months at a time. And a number of medical experts, pedi pediatric experts, um, uh, all sorts of trauma specialists have um, documented the fact that detaining children, locking up children, even with their parents, um, does really incalculable damage uh, and creates incredible trauma for these families. There are alternatives to detention that are widely used for pretrial uh, criminal processes that work. They're more humane, they're more costly, and or less costly and just as effective at getting people to comply with their immigration court proceedings as the, the process plays out. Um, so I just want to close by noting that we need to make sure that our immigration system reflects the values that are enshrined in our Constitution. We need a fair day in court, as Professor, and Sweeney, Professor Sweeney was talking about, which includes access to counsel. We need to have due process for all people to make sure that their parental rights are not terminated and their rights to asylum are not interfered with. And we need to ensure that we continue to have equal protection for all to make sure that we continue to welcome and integrate newcomers to our country. Thank you. Okay, I, I do see that we're running a little short on time, and so a very brief introduction to um, uh, Dr. Serene Shabaya, uh, who's also a lawyer. She's a scholar, advocate for civil rights of immigrants and communities of color. Her work focuses on the Muslim ban, border searches, immigrant rights, and various civil rights matters affecting Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities. Serene. Thank you. And as the person who is from the Middle East, I am habitually late to everything. And Maureen knows this very well. And so <laughs> I am responsible for making this run over time. So I, I'm going to try to keep my comments short. Because I think you might be less familiar with my organization, I'm going to start actually by saying a couple of words about it. I work for an organization called Muslim Advocates. It was founded in 2005, sort of in the aftermath of some of the post 9-11 kind of civil rights and national security responses that were happening. Um, and since that time, its mission has been to be a civil rights organization that uses legal advocacy and public education to promote the rights of all Americans, Americans of all faiths, to live freely and with equal justice. Um, and this is, as part of this mission, the organization has been building out its legal team and its litigation team over the past few years to kind of respond to the fact that policy advocacy has become a little bit less, you know, um, uh, well, anyway. Uh, the, <laughs> it's harder. built out, it's, lit, it's be, right, so policy advocacy became harder and the importance and the need for litigation became something that the organization felt was very important and I came on board as part of that kind of expansion of our litigation into a number of different areas that affect Muslims, Arabs, South Asians, but also immigrants and people of color generally. We have felt that today our primary focus is always obviously on the rights of Muslims, Arabs, and South Asians, but we cannot limit our focus to that. And so we have to work on issues that affect immigrants more broadly because they're gonna come back and affect the communities that we serve broadly as well. Um, and so that's the reason that we've been doing some work in the family separation context, which I'll touch upon briefly. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words about Constitution Day. I mean, I think one thing that is so important for us to keep in mind is that the Constitution ha has always only been as protective as the people who are interpreting and enforcing it, right? Like the Constitution is an important document that has words that can be interpreted in a way that's protective and inclusive or that can be interpreted in a way that shuts people out and doesn't actually provide them, provide them the protection they deserve. And I think it's very, we focus on the judiciary a lot. It's very important that ju the judiciary be there and kind of fully enforcing constitutional protections in, a, in as inclusive a way as possible. But it's also very important that the legislature be there to check things when that's not actually working. And I think that the context of the travel ban, which we call the Muslim ban, 
uh, is a very important kind of illustration of that. Um, in, you know, as one of the first things that, the, that Trump did when he came into office, he enacted a ban against initially seven predominantly Muslim countries. And when I say predominantly Muslim countries, I mean countries that have 98% plus Muslims as their population. And so when you ban those countries, um, it's clear what your target is. Um, and from there, it's become six countries and now five predominantly Muslim countries um, with a couple of kind of additions that amount to maybe like less than 100 people uh, total. And so it still functions predominantly as a Muslim ban. Um, the, you know, many organizations, including my organization, took the Trump administration to court repeatedly over this ban. We won overwhelmingly in the lower courts and then unfortunately we lost at the Supreme Court. Um, but I just want to kind of note that the battle is not over. Um, we're still doing sort of a round two of litigation around the implementation of the ban, and so there's still something to be said there for the role of the judiciary. But we also are still looking to Congress, because Congress actually has the power to stop this ban from coming into effect, and that doesn't get talked about enough. Um, and so to the extent that the landscape changes or Congress changes or the legislature changes, there are ways to make it so that even if there's one person in an executive office that has decided to put in place a policy that is anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant, that's not the end of the story. And so I think that that's just something that is very important for us to remember generally as we think about the Constitution and its meaning and who has the authority to enforce it and make sure that its limitations are respected. It's kind of a co-equal effort between three branches. Um, that's all I'm going to say about the travel ban because you know, we're short on time. I'll move to the family separation issue very briefly. I mean, that's a context where I do think that the courts have played a role that's been fundamental in making sure to correct something that absolutely and truly shocked the conscience. Um, Royce gave you kind of the general landscape. I'll tell you what happened on the litigation front. Um, the, the ACLU filed a major class action that was about ensuring that the families are reunited, right? So that, that uh, litigation was seeking to make sure that the kids who had been separated from their children are brought back to their parents. Uh, sorry, the parents who had been separated from their children are brought back together. Um, and that litigation has been ongoing and it's been very successful. Um, the judge has, a judge ordered reunification uh, of parents and children on June 26, and since that time the government and the litigation team have been kind of battling it out. But reunification is not the end of the story, right? A lot of these people, a lot of these parents came with their children because where they were was not safe for them or for their children. And so simply re reunifying them in order to deport them, which is what the government wanted to do when it was first kind of looking at reunifying children and parents, is not enough because what that means is that they are being denied a fair chance to seek asylum. And so there was a second lawsuit that was filed on behalf of asylum seeking children um, that raised claims on behalf of those children in part to have the continuing assistance of their parents as they go through the asylum process themselves, um, but also sort of raising other claims on behalf of the children. And then we, uh, the Muslim advocates, along with the Legal Aid Justice Center, filed a third lawsuit on behalf of the parents. Because in the immigration context, there is this, um, Maureen talked uh, about sort of the deficiencies in due process in the immigration court system. I'm going to tell you about a system that has even less protections than the immigration court system, which is something called expedited removal. When you present yourself at the border or in some other context, or if you're crossing at, at, a, at a place that is not kind of a, a specific port of entry, the government can place you in what's called expedited removal proceedings. And what that means is that you don't even get the immigration court system. What you get is one shot you get an interview that's called a credible fear interview, or if you're coming back in, you get something called a reasonable fear interview. Both of those things are things that you get if you say that you're afraid of returning to your home country, and if the officer who, to whom you say this actually follows the law. And it's a very limited interview. It's an interview with an asylum officer during which you're supposed to, after having taken a journey that sometimes takes months, after being completely traumatized and shaken and maybe escaping things that have already made you you know, put you in a very difficult position, that's when you're supposed to make your case for why you get to stay here. Um, and if you fail that, you get one review by an immigration judge, which is a very limited kind of review. It doesn't sort of sweep broadly. It just looks at the determination and says up or down. Um, you know, most often, especially along the border, it's, a, it's up. It doesn't really matter what the underlying determination said. And then you're done. If you fail that interview, 
and a judge affirms that failure, like not a real judge, but an immigration judge, then you get deported. And it doesn't matter what you were fleeing. And so one thing that happened in the family separation context is that we were seeing tons of parents whom we thought had really strong asylum claims failing their credible fear interviews. And we started looking deeper and saying, what's going on there? I mean, a lot of things were going on. But one thing especially that was going on is that those parents were absolutely and completely traumatized by the fact that their children had been taken away from them. And they were getting this one shot at saving your life interview while their kids were not with them, when they had been forcibly taken away from them in ways that I can't even describe to you. Like the parents were saying, we were told my kid was going to take a bath, and then the kid disappeared. Or I was taken to court for criminal prosecution. I came back, my kid wasn't there. It's not like people were being prepared, at least, so that they could give their kids documents or tell their kids they're going camping or something to make the separation easier. And a lot of the parents were actually getting those interviews while they still did not know where their children were or if their children were safe. And many of them reported like, that they were anxious, they were feeling ill, they were dizzy, they couldn't even remember what happened at their interview. Many of them said that they were trying to rush through the interview so that they could ask about their children at the end, which means that basically they were not able to take advantage of the one shot at asylum that you get when you present yourself here and the government chooses to put you in these very expedited, very limited um, proceedings. And so what has happened in the, three, in the context of the three lawsuits that have been brought is that in addition to reunification, uh, the parties have now come to an agreement with the government, um, which the court has you know, viewed positively, but will have to sort of formally approve very soon, that will give all of the parents who failed their negative credible fear interview and their reasonable fear interviews a second look, essentially, which is something really unprecedented in this context, um, to have kind of massive numbers of people getting another look uh, and you know, the papers say it has to be a good faith look <laughs> where you know, the determination is reviewed, the parents get a second speak to, and they can present new evidence, and they can have attorneys present, which is more than you usually get when you're presenting yourself at the border initially. And so that, I think, is an example of a kind of win that you can get through immigration. It's not over yet. It's not, you know, the court has to approve it. The plan has to be implemented. I'm sure we're going to run into a number of issues. But that's one way that you can sort of use the court system to try to get justice for people who have been denied justice. I'm going to close on that note, and you know, we can wow. say more in Q&A. OK. Um, we've had three fantastic speakers. I'd like everybody to give them a quick round of applause. Uh, we are running short on time. I know people are going to leave uh, when the bell rings. I would like to invite uh, Dean Ball to come up and make a couple of comments. And then with remaining time, we'd like to open it up for questions that you have for our panelists. Any questions that you can't get to because of the shortness of time, um, I'd like to work something out where you could write them down and send them to me and I could forward them to the panelists and we could continue the dialogue because we think that's very important. Dean Ball, thank you. Thanks, Robert. Um, I want to thank the panelists for joining us today. Thank you very much for coming to College Park and sharing your expertise and knowledge. And I'm delighted uh, to see all the students here. You know, Constitution Day was set up in part because people were worried that the new generation wasn't engaging in the constitutional study, understanding it, realizing how important the document is for our society. And uh, when Robert first came and proposed in discussions that we would focus on immigration for Constitution Day, I could not think of a more appropriate topic. The Constitution is the document we refer to when trying to understand many of the most challenging problems our society faces. And right now, here we have a United States where we have a history of immigrants contributing to every major thing we've done, whether it be the arts, whether it be commerce, whether it be education. Immigrants have brought such richness to our society, and yet, and yet, there is concern that they're also taking from us and diminishing the society. And it is very important that we resolve this with data-driven decision-making and thinking about this in a critical context that's not based on emotion, but which is based on the interpretation of law and the data relevant to that interpretation. And so we've had here a series of, uh, of, of talks which have 
have shown the challenges associated with um, using the Constitution in the way it should be to ensure that we have a just society and that we can uh, do the kinds of compromises we need between wanting to have a safe society but also having society that is rich and successful as we've been so lucky in many times to share. So um, I don't want to say much more than that to say how pleased I am with the event and uh, I, I hope we can have some time for discussion. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. Okay, great. So we do have seven, eight minutes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the mic out here. If anybody has any questions and they'd like to line up, we're going to get to as many of the questions as we can before our time runs out. Thank you. Please, anybody? Somebody. I have a question. Come on up. I actually don't know that I can make it all the way through. Um, and I apologize for the uh, first professor. I, I, I didn't catch your last name uh, from the law school. First speaker. Sweeney. Thanks again so much for coming and talking to us. One of the things that caught me in your first thing is you mentioned like this, like, I, I, and perhaps I'm wrong and I misquoted you, but you had this, like, this turn of phrase, like the robustness of the Constitution. And I'm on Constitution Day, after hearing about child separation, after hearing about indefinite detention, after hearing about, like, in my lifetime, a whole host of other activities, and you're like, what's, what's a metric for determining, like, measuring robustness? Like, what does it mean for the Constitution to be robust? in the face of many of the things we talk about today. What it, what it means is that we have, uh, we have courts. I mean, in, the, in this instance, Serene talked about how we're relying more on the courts at the moment than we, than we have in recent decades. Um, the courts are providing a check. The courts ordered that the families be reunited. The court is, is accepting this agreement that happened in the context of judicial litigation uh, to give the parents another chance. Um, we have to fight to enforce the law. It's, uh, as Serene absolutely correctly said, without the, an interpretation and without advocates and communities really working for that interpretation, it's just a piece of paper. Um, so I think you know, the, the results that we see, the results we see with the Maryland theft offense, right? That is, for decades, the, the executive was trying to, did one thing with it, and now the courts have said, no, you can't do that anymore. So that's where the separation of powers really uh, makes a difference. Thank you. Anybody else? Please, come on up. Hi. Um, the second speaker, um, I forget your name also, um, but you mentioned how the refugee targets, the only one that was over target uh, was European, ref or maybe it wasn't refugees, but just immigrants. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about interpretation of the law, um, this like subjective interpretation and how it's been tied to race um, throughout US history. Wow. <laughs> That's big. Very easy question. Well, we yeah. do have five minutes. <laughs> Uh, we may need a follow-up conversation after this, given the time and the breadth of the question. I mean, I do think that in the refugee context, no doubt, um, and, and you know, Professor Sweeney opened her remarks talking about our history of um, Chinese exclusion, and Serene closed with um, her discussion about the Muslim ban, and there's a lot of history in between those two. So this is part of our history, no doubt. And in the immigration context, there is a lot of discretion. Um, the plenary power of the government is broad um, on immigration. So we will see that power used, for better or worse, um, in, in a variety of ways that do work to the detriment of, of certain populations. And, I, and to Professor Sweeney's point, I think it's a, uh, incumbent upon the courts and an active citizenry to use them to provide that check. I can at least say on the refugee program, um, which is a discretionary program as well, that um, you know my remarks about the Europeans, I mean, out of the 3,173 that were um, authorized to be admitted this past year, to, um, excuse me, out of the 2,000 who were authorized to be admitted this past year, 3,173 were admitted. And as I said before, nearly all of the other categories were at 50%. Anybody else? Sir, uh, I know this is Constitution Day, but a couple of you mentioned international law. I wonder if you could just take a couple of moments and talk about the intersection um, between international law, international protections, and Constitution and, and U.S. law. Are there rights that are being given?
given they are that we can focus on. Serene, you want to take it? Sure. I mean, or anyone else can, can jump in. Um, I've, it's been a while since I've kind of focused on international law. But the one thing that I will say is that the US is actually signatory to a lot of different international laws and protections, which should be applied in the same way here. And um, there's a clear context in which, for example, a variety of United Nations bodies have talked about some of the measures that have been taken in this administration and how they conflict with um, you know, civil rights and human rights obligations that the United States has that it's not meeting. And it should be said that particularly in the refugee context, the United States was actually one of the countries that kind of pushed for the creation of this convention that says that people take refugees and the asylum laws are supposed to be a, a kind of domestic version of those international protections, which are being wildly flouted, I think, uh, on a very regular basis. I, one, one other thing to say about this refugee numbers, which I think ties in a little bit with this point that you're making, it's remarkable the way that the distributions are done because actually the majority of the world's refugees right now come from Afghanistan, Somalia, and Syria. So like three predominantly Muslim countries that are basically being shut out completely and being subjected to special and extra vetting beyond the years of vetting that every refugee gets anyway. Um, and so that I think is absolutely in violation of the spirit of the international law protections that say that you know people have certain rights as refugees. I think everything that's happening at the border absolutely runs counter to the rights that people get as refugees and asylum seekers in any country all around the world. Um, but other people may have you know, more to add to this. Okay. Oh, one more, please. Sorry. And just loud, please. Sure. Uh, do you have any advice for people who are subject to travel ban uh, exceptions and granting uh, and So that is a topic that is, you know, I think, in the, you know, I can't really speak to individual cases. We've certainly assisted people in trying to seek those waivers, but I will tell you that the grant rate sits at somewhere around 2% or probably less than that. Um, we have ongoing litigation in California about this issue, but it's also something that you're welcome to contact Muslim advocates, contact my organization. Um, you can find our information through the website, <laughs> and we'd be happy to kind of, you know, uh, fill that out further. And if we do have a list of everybody uh, through the sign-in sheet, uh, we will send a message to you with the website links and to contact our panelists. You can send any questions to me. Those of you that are in uh, my classes at MWAT 304, we're going to be talking about these issues on Thursday. You have some readings. Come in with questions. And let's keep that going. Uh, uh, yes, Royce, one more comment? Just to close, for those who are really wanting to stay engaged in these issues, the American Immigration Council puts out a daily blog Monday through Friday. You can text the word FACTS, F-A-C-T-S, FACTS, to 51555, and you'll subscribe to the blog. We also have an effort to plug in volunteers to assist with um, immigrants who were detained. You don't have to be a lawyer to assist. There are a variety of ways to assist. And you can go to immigrationjustice.us. Listen, these are folks that are on the front lines. Um, you don't want to call them heroes, but I do. And, and there's a lot of work ahead of us. I invite all of you to stay involved, um, to reach out, to do something. There's a lot of work to be done. Thank you so much.